Good, amen? Amen. amen. Now, if you don't know Jesus is your friend, you need to figure that out at some point. Did you know that God is for you? Yeah, he's not against you. It's a beautiful day. I got up this morning, went outside, and it was actually cool outside. <laughs> amen. Yeah, praise the Lord. I'll take I'll take more of those days. Seasons are changing right in front of our eyes here. I'm glad that you're here today. If you're looking for a church home. We'd love to have you be a part of what we're doing here. We've got room for you, and there's room in the house of God for his saints. Can you say amen to that? Today we're going to, we're going to start a journey together through the book of Ephesians. It's an interesting thing, this little book of Ephesians. And, um, and I was ambitious this week. I sent Shannon a, a text, and I thought, well, we'll probably get through 14 or so verses today. We're not going to get that far, just to let you know. Um, I, I have recognized lately that um, that something is afoot, and, and I don't know if you've realized it or not. The headlines um, are are giving us a, some insight, I think, into the times we're living in today. Um, something is going to happen soon, and um, and I'm not sure what that something is. I know Jesus is coming back soon. But it seems as though events are unfolding here, building to a climax. And if you can't tell that politically, socially, financially, um, then you're, you're just not very aware, maybe, of what's going on in the world today. But things today are, are getting quite, quite precarious, and I'm discovering that our greatest need today is the need to know who Jesus is. You need to know who Christ is. Not just in some sort of vague sense, some vague idea that, yeah, maybe Jesus is a God. Maybe he's even a cool God. And, um, and, and that's fine. That's not what I'm talking about. I've, I've realized, I'm with a lot of young people. I do a lot of mission trips and things like that. And I've realized that there's a lot of young people, and I reckon it translates as you get older. But there's a lot of people today who, who don't really understand that Jesus is their personal savior. They recognize that Jesus is a God, maybe the God of their parents or their grandparents. They go to church, go through the motions of worship even, but don't really understand who Jesus really is. And my hope and my prayer is, is that you'll figure that out very soon, because we're running out of time. Um, I, I wouldn't be a very good pastor if I, just, if I just lackadaisically told you, yeah, at some point in your life you need to figure out who Jesus is, um, and not giving you a warning that, some, that things are changing. And the landscape is changing today. And if you're not aware enough and alert enough to recognize that, it's, 
my job to let you know that. And, uh, and things aren't continuing now as they always have. And you can, you can start looking at things and looking at numbers and statistics, and you may be frightened when you do so to discover that even in our country, the national debt is over $18 trillion. Now, I don't know if you can even fathom a number that high. It's, it's an amazing thing when you start thinking about just our national debt, and nobody's talking about it. <laughs> but the politicians are too busy throwing stones at each other to actually deal with issues. But $18 trillion is no laughing matter. It's not something you can pay off with your credit card, although that's what we try to do, is just scan the credit card again. Um, things are unsustainable. Politically, socially, economically, financially, things are unsustainable. Something's going to give. And um, if, if you look at other nations and how they're dealing with it, there's governments that are being overthrown. There's wars being fought. There are over 9 million Syrian refugees. People just like you and I, who happen to live in a different part of the world, no longer live in their homes because of war, because of, of, of tragedy that has happened to them in their neighborhoods, because the landscape is shifting. You need more than anything else today, you need to have a good understanding of who Christ is and who you are in his sight. And so this, this letter, this, this little letter that Paul wrote from prison of all places, now I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand if you've ever been to prison, okay? There's been some things I don't need to know, okay? <laughs> But Paul didn't let prison stop him from doing what God had called him to do. God had called Paul into service to spread the good news, to spread the gospel about Jesus Christ. And even though his hands were tied, literally, in a prison, he didn't let that stop him. His public proclamation ministry just changed, and he picked up a pen, and he began to write. And this is one of four or five letters that he wrote at first imprisonment in Rome. It's around AD 60 to set the time frame for you. It's, it's very early in the first century. And, and Paul is just there, and he's, and he's got a lot on his mind. And he writes this letter to these people, probably in Ephesus, although it's vague whether or not it was actually addressed to the Ephesians personally or not. There's no real major issue going on. Some of Paul's letters, he's addressing a major issue that there's a sticky point in their theology, there's something going on in their church, and he's writing to address a certain issue. There isn't really a big issue in Ephesians. It's more, it's more a letter to really help us understand who Christ is, and that you need to be a part of who Christ is. Uh, Paul mentions a phrase, we'll see it this morning even, he mentions a phrase around 35, 36 times in this one letter, and that phrase is, in Christ, in Christ. Paul reckons that's where you need to be in Christ. We're going to talk about some of that this morning. But before we jump into this too far, let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, we pause here at the beginning acknowledging your presence and thanking you for it. And I pray, Lord, that as we, as we begin this journey together this morning through the book of Ephesians, that you would take us by the hand, that you would also, Father, take us by the heart. And that you would lead us to the places that we need to go and that you give us eyes to see, Father, what you're trying to teach us. Help us, Father, to understand something of your grace and peace today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Hope you brought a Bible with you. Although we won't get far today, I'll just let you know that. Um, it's good for you to, to read your Bible. This, uh, this book of Ephesians, it, it really is a, it's an interesting book. I've been studying through it some lately. And, um, and you, have to know, you have to know something. And, and one of the things that you need to know is that God places a calling on everyone's life. And, and God has placed a calling on your life as well. And many times we run from those calls because they scare us. But God has always given us a calling. He calls people to do certain things. And, and knowing who you are is a big thing. You know, anytime somebody's given a title that maybe you've been... You've been asked to serve in a certain position at work. Um, somebody wanted to give you a title. I remember years ago, they asked me to serve as the, um, the youth director for the Arkansas Louisiana Conference and the camp director of Camp Yorktown Bay. And I said, well, that's a big title. That's a lot, but, but what does that mean? Because having a title and not knowing what, you, what it means, it, it's not gonna get you very far. So I, I called down the conference office and I asked them, I said, I wanna pray about this. Is that something I want to jump into um, just willy-nilly? It sounds like a, a, a big responsibility. I need to know what the job description is. That's an important thing, by the way. 
Before you say yes to a job, you need to know what you're getting into. Amen? And, and so I asked them for a job description. And they said, well, I, they gave me an answer I didn't expect because they said, well, we don't know if we really have one. <laughs> and after a few days, they sent me something from a file that was about 12 years old that was completely irrelevant and out of date to the position that I was being asked to serve. What I found is they were wanting me to serve in a position, but there's no definition of what that position is. And it becomes very difficult then to measure success or defeat in a position like that. How do you know if you're doing it right? It, it's an interesting thing. I was thinking today that perhaps there are some here who understand and, and maybe even propose that they have a title of Christian this morning, but they really don't understand the job description. That, that we don't really understand what that entails when we claim to be Christian. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? What does that look like in our daily life? By the way, Jesus wants you to know. Did you know that? That God wants you to know what it means to be a Christian. And I think Paul gives us a little insight. And, and today, my hope and my prayer is that we're going to discover who we are as believers. And then as believers, what God has called us to do about it. Not many people today question the authorship of Ephesians. Because it begins with an interesting word. And it's the word Paul. <laughs> he puts his name right at the beginning. He says Paul. And there's very few people who doubt its authorship. And verse 1 starts with the word, I've got a new King James Version. And it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And this small part of this introductory sentence really tells us a lot about the author right off the bat. First, firstly, we notice that Paul claims to be somebody. And his claim is that he is an apostle. He claims to be an apostle. Now, I've discovered some things in my time on planet Earth, and one of those things is, is that there's a whole lot of people who know a lot of things that I don't know. Have you figured that out yet? Yeah. I know some stuff, but there's a whole lot of people who know stuff I don't know. I've never welded before. Anybody in here know how to use a welder? Some of you guys do. I've never done that. Never done it. I, I have heard somebody say, though, in a conversation, talking to another welder, yeah, when you weld a corner, you've got to be careful of arc blow. So you don't want that weld to go somewhere. And I thought, arc blow. I had no idea what the, I had to look it up. And some of you are saying, what's an arc got to do with welding? I thought Noah built the arc. <laughs> I, there's some people that know stuff that you don't know, and that's okay. Do you know the great answer if somebody asks you something and you don't know? you know the greatest answer? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But you ought to find out, right? You ought to do your best to find out. Now, as a theologian, sometimes I'm guilty for assuming that people know things that I know. And we use that word apostle. But I'm wondering this morning, if you had a, a test question and it says, what is an apostle? And you had to fill in the blank. I wonder how you'd do on the test. And some people might say, well, it's one of those guys that hung out with Jesus back in the day. Uh, some people might say, well, it was one of those, that inner 12, the ones that Jesus called his own special buddies, that, that inner group. And maybe your answer would go along those lines. But an apostle, if you don't know, apostle is, is specifically an ambassador of the gospel. That, that's what apostle is. A, a commissioner of Christ, and often associated with miraculous powers, by the way. An apostle is, in a nutshell, a messenger. It, it's somebody sent like a delegate with a specific message. That's an apostle. And so Paul calls himself an apostle. He owns that title. He says, I am an apostle. And in so doing, he claims that he has been sent. In other words, I'm an ambassador for Christ and I have a message. That's what he says right off the bat. I've got something for you that's not coming from me. It's coming from, it's coming from Christ. I'm an ambassador. But that's not all he's saying because Paul says that he became an, an apostle not by passing some sort of test. He, he didn't do that. He wasn't just, he wasn't just uh, testing out, you know, oh, yeah, if you score this score, you, you can become an apostle. It's not medical school. Um, it wasn't by virtue of his hard work, determined effort. You know, you, you've done that job so good. We think we're going to promote you into this job. That wasn't what it is either. He says he became an apostle because it was God's will for him to be an apostle. By God's will, he is an apostle. I, I wonder if you've discovered God's will for your life yet. Because God has a will for your life. Did you know that? that God has a purpose for you. It's his will. It's his ultimate plan 
for your life. Paul says, I've got it figured out. I know what, my, what God's will is for my life. You know, God doesn't want you to simply exist on planet Earth for maybe 60, 70 decades, six or seven decades. He, he, he doesn't want you just to hang around here and watch, watch some TV and maybe exercise every once in a while, maybe even do a random act of kindness every once in a while and then retire into the kingdom. That's not his plan for your life. Okay? That's no plan, by the way. Now, God wants more from you. He wants more for you than that. And so he's given you a calling. I remember when God called me into ministry and I was a meat cutter and I said, I'm just going to be a meat cutter. <laughs> and I ran from that calling. God may not be calling you into ministry, but he's calling you to do something, to do something. And maybe it's to be a meat cutter. Maybe it's to be a carpenter. Maybe it's to be a greeter at Walmart. But if God is calling you to that, you need to follow that calling. Paul recognized the calling on his life. I, I remember when my children were young, my wife had this thing, we call it the goodie bag. Maybe your parents did something like that. Maybe you still do. And she would get these random little toys uh, from the clearance rack in the toy store, or little books. And uh, she would put them inside this goodie bag. Now the goodie bag was special. Uh, she kept it up in the closet. The kids couldn't reach it. That's a good tip, by the way, for you. You have a goodie bag. And uh, she'd get this bag down occasionally whenever our children would do something especially nice. It wasn't all the time because they're kids. But um, when it, whenever they performed a certain task without complaining or they did something particularly nice, she'd bring out the goodie bag. And she would let them get one thing out of the goodie bag. And boy, they would look through it. She said, now you got to choose quick. You can't be looking at everything in the goodie bag. And, and so they, they would pick something out. And they were happy, excited as they could be because they got to get in the goodie bag. It was a big deal. And the toys weren't expensive. The books weren't, they weren't expensive. It really wasn't much. But it was something that filled them with delight, something that filled them with joy. They were happy receiving the little prize. Do you know the Lord wants to give you good things? Did you know that? He wants to give you good things, better things than you can find on the discount shelf in the toy store, too, by the way. Yeah, God wants to give you good things. He wants, he wants to give you a life, a, a real life, a real life, one that is perpetual in joy, joy that comes from receiving something unexpected. And, and because he wants to give you great things, he has invested great things. See, my wife gave little things. She invested little. God wants to give you great things, and because of that, he's invested greatly. I'm reminded of Luke chapter 11. You have your Bible there? Luke chapter 11. There's a story there, and, and it's Jesus telling a parable, and he's telling a parable that's very familiar maybe to you. And we're going we're gonna to look at verse 13, but just prior to verse 13, Jesus has been talking, and he's talking about how parents want to give good gifts to their children, and we all do. If you're a parent, I know you do. Sometimes you want to wring your kid's neck, if we're being honest. But most of the time, you want to give them good gifts. And in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, Jesus has been talking about how much we want to give good gifts. And he concludes with this. He says, if you then, being evil, and the assumption is that we are, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? See, the ultimate gift, according to Christ, is receiving the Holy Spirit. God can give the best gift because he has invested the most. See, because he has purchased the best gift for us. Jesus paid the price for us, and he exchanged places with us. And so that instead of condemnation, which we deserve, we instead receive the fullness of the blessing that belonged to him, which really he deserved. My children never put anything inside the goodie bag. Did you know that? They never contributed anything to the goodie bag. But they always got stuff out. God is always giving us things from the divine goodie bag, if you will. He's always giving us things. My wife's goodie bag never ran out because she would always go out and get something else, see, to put in the goodie bag. Things that she thought would delight our children. And God has a desire to bless you. He is for you. And he has gifts to give you from, from his own good pleasure. Now, now, it's something that's interesting because Paul says that he's an apostle. Uh, an apostle and, it, and it means an ambassador. Okay, 
So Paul says, look, I'm, I'm a messenger for God, and it's God's will for me to be a messenger. And by the way, I'm wondering, because Paul says, I'm an apostle by God's will. I'm wondering if you could say this, that you understand God's will for your life, and that you're actually living out God's will for your life. But because it's the difference between knowing what God's will is for your life and actually performing God's will in your life. And the question is, first of all, do you understand God's will? And secondly, if you do, are you actually performing? Because that's where the rubber meets the road, as it were. God wants you to live out his will for your life. And Paul writes from this perspective of ambassadorship. He's writing from this perspective of calling. He says, look, I'm an apostle. God has given me a message. I'm doing his will. And the people he addresses in the letter, he uses an interesting word. You see it in your Bible? He's writing to the saints. To the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. And who are the saints? Well, firstly, you should know one thing. You know the word saints in the New Testament never occurs in the singular. It's always plural. Did you know that? The implication is you can't be a saint by yourself. That's the implication. And yet today, in society, in, in the world we're living in, right here in the United States, there's, there's some changes that have taken place over the last couple of decades. And more recently, the latest surveys from Barna I found fascinating. And you guys probably aren't survey people, but I think they're intriguing because they give us sort of a, a blood pressure check. You know, <laughs> They kind of put our finger on the pulse and help us to see what's going on. Do you know this latest poll from Barna shows that more people are claiming that they believe in God and that they pray more than the last survey they did five years ago? That there's an increase in spirituality within the United States. And at the same time there's an increase in spirituality, there's a lowering in church attendance. Okay? I want you to I want to let that gel for a minute, because some of you are looking at me sideways. Okay. More people are claiming that God is important to them, and less people are attending church. So you have more people saying God is important and less people going to public worship. Why is that? Well, because people are saying, I don't need public worship in order to worship the living God. Uh, I don't need to go to church to pray. Okay? Church is either too far away, too inconvenient, all they want is my money. That's what the surveys are saying. Okay? And, and so the, there's this, 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 this continuity taking place in spirituality today. People are claiming to be spiritual, but not religious. Maybe you hear people say that. Well, I'm spiritual, I'm just not religious. Okay? And there's this dichotomy that's trying to take place. According to scripture, it's an impossible thing. Saints need each other. Did you know that? We need each other. We, we need to be supportive of one another. We need to come together and worship because we draw strength from one another. We draw assurance from one another. We can share our victories and our failures in a safe place with each other when we're together in worship, the saints. It, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. Some think that they can get by just fine on their own, not being involved in corporate worship. And I have to tell you, that's a dangerous decision. It's dangerous to be out there by yourself. Like-minded followers of God who will encourage you and help you are needed. Folks who will strengthen your resolve as you face temptations, as you face obstacles along your faith journey. And by the way, we need you here. You might be thinking, well, this church would do fine without me. I can come or go or miss or not miss. We need you here. Because if you decide to miss and everybody else decides to miss, we have no worship going on here. You understand what I'm saying? We need you as part of what we're doing. We need your input. We need, we need to hear about your faith journey as well. So who are the saints? Well, the Greek word is interesting because the Greek word is hagios. And that may mean nothing to you until you figure out what hagios is. Is. And some of you are going, oh, I know that word. That word actually means holy. Did you know that? In fact, that word is translated holy 161 times in the New Testament. It's translated saints 61. Saints are holy according to scripture. And you're thinking, well, pastor, that ain't me. <laughs> that ain't me. The word implies separation from common use. It means that these are people that have separated themselves from the common things. 
separated themselves from common things. It means they've been called out of a common existence and in to something else, into a state of holiness. Having been called out, they find themselves inside the in group. And you may be asking yourselves, well, what have they gotten themselves into? Well, my daughter-in-law, she, she just, just completed her certification pastor test and all that. Now she is a licensed realtor in the state of Ohio, which means that now she can, uh, she can help with transactions and buying and selling real estate and property and all those kinds of things. And if you've never bought land, uh, real estate or anything like that, um, there, there's, a, there's some advice that I think every realtor you, you'll ever meet will tell you that there's three things you need to pay attention to when you're about to buy a home or property. Remember what those three things are? Location, location, location. That's what they'll tell you, that, that you need to know where you're buying. Where you're buying is probably more important than what you're buying, okay? Where you're buying. Location, location, location. And according to what we've just read in this little letter of Ephesians, these saints have been called out. They've been called out of a common life, separated for holy works, and they're now located somewhere. And according to Paul, it's in Christ. That's where they're located. They're in Christ. And he uses that phrase 35, 36 times in this little letter, in Christ. That means they're within the sphere of influence of Jesus Christ. They're living their life under the influence of Jesus Christ. They're in him, according to Paul, in Christ. An investor, by the way, would say that's prime real estate, okay? They're there, they're in Christ, and, and they're in Christ, and when they're in Christ, they're always described as faithful. The ones that aren't faithful are the ones that aren't in Christ, see? Which should give you a little hint as we move along here that if you want to be faithful, you need to be somewhere. And that somewhere that you need to be is in Christ. You need to, you need to be there. And by the way, that's you. Uh, Paul is writing this to you, to the saints, the ones that have been called out. God wants you to be among the saints. He's calling you out of common practices of sin and shame. And he's calling you into the holy place of God's presence in Christ. By the way, there's no shame there in Christ. There's only grace. There's only peace there. You wouldn't likely be here today if you hadn't been called out. The fact of the matter is that God is calling everyone out. And when you hear the call of God on your life, please don't ignore it. Don't run from it. I did that for years. It didn't end well for me. And by the way, I, I hear people say so-and-so is running from God. Where do they think they're going to go? <laughs> do you think you can outrun God? Do you think there's anywhere you're going to end up that God can't find you? Don't run. Just submit to God. He knows everything about you. He knows where you've been, what you did. He knows all that stuff. And you know what he chooses to do? He chooses to give you grace. He chooses to give you, to give you peace. You may be thinking it can't be that easy. I've had young people tell me that. Pastor, it can't be that easy. Pastor, you don't have any idea about what I've done. Where I, you don't, if you knew, Pastor... You'd say there's no way. You know God knows already. I don't need to know where you've been. And he chooses to give you grace. Yeah, he chooses that. He, he could con condemn you, but he says, I didn't come to do that. I came to give you grace. See, you might be thinking God can't really want me because I have nothing to offer. I don't have anything to give God. Why would he even want to hang out with me? Well, I don't know what you've heard, but none of the saints have anything good to give God. My children never contributed anything to the goodie bag, but they always got stuff out of it, you see? Some people ask, can God really forgive my sin? Well, I can tell you emphatically that yes, he can. And he wants to. In fact, God wants to forgive you more than you want to be forgiven. You ought to wrestle with that at some point. God wants you to be forgiven more than you want to be forgiven. He wants to forgive you. He wants you to be forgiven. To be forgiven. He's called you. He wants you. He loves you. And by the way, when you accept God's calling on your life, you're going to realize very quickly that he is asking for you to participate in, in his work. And it happens usually very quickly. When God calls you from your life of sin, when he calls you to be in Christ, he wants you to help 
others to hear the calling on their life. See, he wants you to share the good, simple story of Jesus' birth and his life and his death and his resurrection and that Jesus is coming back soon. We call it the gospel. It's not just good news. It's great news. And God wants us to share that with other people so they have a chance to hear the call of God for themselves. And so this letter, this book of Ephesians, as we refer to it, comes from an apostle to the saints, of which you are one. If you'll just accept the call, you're one. Saints who have been called out of the world and called into Christ. They've been called out. That's what the church is, by the way. Did you know that? The ecclesia? It's the assembly. It's the called out ones. It's the group of saints. That's what it is. So this letter, this, this book of Ephesians comes that way. And by, that, by the way, that phrase, in Christ, is everything. Did you know that? To be in Christ is everything. The saints are only faithful as long as they're in Christ. This letter is, is written to you, by the way, in Christ. And Paul, and I want you to make sure that you understand that this letter is written for you. It's written to you. And you might say, well, Pastor, I wasn't around in 62 AD. Uh, I, I wasn't there when Paul was in his prison cell. I wasn't around back then. I may look old, but I'm not that old. I, I, I wasn't there when Paul picked up a pen and began to write. But I want you to know this letter is addressed to somebody. And he says it's to the saints who are in Christ. The saints that are in Christ Jesus. And you may not always feel faithful. And you may not always act like a saint. Maybe you're still trying to decide if you even want to be faithful or if you even want to be a saint. But if you're being honest with yourself, you know you don't always act like one. But I want you to understand something today. God has called you to be faithful. He's called you to be in Christ. The challenge is this. And I think here's where we mess up. We recognize God's calling on us. We, we realize that God is calling us out of sin. We realize that God is calling us to be faithful. But God hasn't called you to be faithful by yourself. See? He's called you out of darkness, and he's called you to be in Christ. Because he knows that when you're in Christ, you're going to be faithful. See? That you're going to be in Christ's presence. He knew you couldn't do it alone. And so he allows you entrance into the divine goodie bag. See? But the moment you say yes, he says, let me give you some stuff. And he begins to give you things. He gives you strength. He gives you joy. He gives you peace. He gives you humility. He gives you spiritual gifts. And this letter is written to you so that you can be reminded that you are a saint. That you can be faithful as long as you are in the right location. In Christ. In Christ. And so this letter is written to the saints that are faithful in Christ. I want you to see what Paul says to us, church. Verse 2. We made it all the way to verse 2. <laughs> verse 2. I know. <laughs> Look what he says. Grace to you, King J New King James. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. I had to look it up in the Greek. You know I did. Because I, I wanted to make sure. Do you know the very first word from the message that, that God gives his servant to tell us is? It's the word grace. It's the word grace. The very first, the opening word from God is grace. 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 And Paul is using a familiar greeting. The Greeks would greet each other that way. They'd greet each other with grace. The Jews would greet each other with peace. They would say shalom. And so Paul is including everybody. He's saying everybody is included, whether you've been a follower of God for generations like the Jews, or whether this following Jesus thing, this one God thing is new to you as it was for the Greeks. God has a message for you. And the message is grace. And the message is peace. And by the way, when he says grace to you, it's plural. Did you know that? It's plural. He's saying grace to y'all. That's what we would say here. All y'all. Grace. Grace to you. It means, by the way, grace means that which affords joy. Did you know that? Grace means pleasure, delight, sweetness. Paul is telling us that God is looking on you with favor. That God has a plan for you, that he wants to bless you, and he sends you grace. He's, he's smiling on you. 
and he wants you to have peace. Peace. I'll tell you, grace and peace. That's, what, that's the best gifts. That's way better than some discount toy from the toy store. Amen? Mm. Grace and peace. You can't buy that on Amazon.com. Way better than a toy made in China. Way better than a mansion in Beverly Hills. There's nothing you can buy on planet Earth that's better than grace and peace. Amen. Things of Earth suffer from age and decay. You know, we give gifts to each other, and sometimes we even give good gifts to each other. And, and we, we give these gifts knowing that in the back of our mind, these gifts aren't going to last forever. It's going to break. It's going to require batteries. It's going to need to be repainted at some point. You're going to have to, if it's a really good gift, you're going to have to change the oil in it. And, and uh, We give these gifts knowing that it's going to cost the other person something. And yet we give those gifts because we love that other person. God gives grace. He gives peace. He gives eternal things that will never expire. You know the best gift you can give somebody, if you haven't figured it out yet, is the gift of time. It's the gift of your presence. Your time. We, we all have a limited amount of time. And everybody only gets 24 hours in a day. Time. It doesn't cost you anything, but it's the best gift you can give to somebody. Time. Give somebody your time. Those moments. And you can remember those moments when somebody actually came by and just spent some time with you. They, they just gave you some time. But they didn't have to. They just did. And it's priceless. And that's why Jesus gives us time. He offers us an eternity of time in his presence. And by the way, he also offers us a lifetime of living in his presence right now. You can't put a price tag on that. He, he sends his messenger, Paul, with a message of grace and peace. And by the way, peace, uh, listen to this sentence I found. Peace is a tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God, peace means we're content with our earthly lot of whatsoever sort it is. It's why Paul can write from prison. He can write from a prison cell and say, God is giving us grace and peace. Grace and peace. Doesn't matter if you're a prince or a pauper, you can enjoy peace as long as you're in Christ. Outside of Christ, there is no peace. Outside of Christ, there is no grace. But in Christ, in Christ, there's both peace and grace. In Cincinnati this past week, I don't know if you pay attention to the news much. You can Google it. Don't do it now. Do it later. In Cincinnati this last week, there, were a, there was an unusual amount of heroin overdoses that resulted in deaths. Now, I don't know if you know or not that there is a heroin epidemic in our country right now. Our nation is suffering from a heroin epidemic. You might have thought, well, I thought that stuff was done in the 70s. It's not. It's not. Heroin use has increased drastically in the last few years. And hundreds of people are dying from overdoses. I don't know if you know that or not. But they're thinking it's because of abuse of hydrocodone, those opiate drugs that people are getting. They get hooked on those, and then they just jump to the next level, which is heroin. And by the way, 98% of the heroin that's produced in the world comes from Afghanistan. Did you know that? And Afghanistan had a bumper crop of poppies this last year. There's a ton of heroin on the streets. And in Cincinnati this last week, Somebody, instead of cutting it with what they normally cut it with, which is fentanyl. <laughs> you know what that is? That's the stuff they give you when they put you to sleep in a surgery, the doc. That's the stuff that killed Michael Jackson. It's the stuff they found in Prince's system as well, okay? Instead of cutting with that, there's a drug dealer who cut it with an elephant tranquilizer that, that they say is a thousand times more potent than fentanyl. You see, the way heroin works is people get it and they, they, they end up injecting it directly into their vein. They mainline it, is what they call it. And it gives you an instant euphoric rush. But it doesn't last very long. It's followed, by the way, with what they say is uh, just this peace. See? But it's temporary. 
And after 15 or 20 minutes, they're rigging up another needle because, because they need some more of that. And they slam it into their veins again, and, and it has decreasing returns, which means you have to increase the dose. And what starts out at a little becomes a lot in a very short amount of time. And they get a hook very quickly. And in Cincinnati this last week, because of this drug dealer who, who laced the heroin with an elephant tranquilizer, the result was, was pretty horrific, honestly. In 24 hours, 48 people had died. Yeah. Last week, 170 deaths resulted from heroin overdose. By the way, the next day it had increased to 180 plus. They're still dying. Under the influence of heroin, these people injected what they thought was their normal dose, but it was their last dose. It's tragic. And, and yet it's a good reminder for us. Because if you're not under the influence <clears throat> of the Holy Spirit, you'll be under the influence of something or someone. And the enemy has plenty of options for you, whether it's drugs or alcohol or pornography or something. The enemy will hold you under his influence and it won't end well. This enemy wants you to remain under his influence and he offers higher and higher highs. And he's going to make it very enticing for you to stay under his influence. He doesn't want you to think about how this road you are on will end. But believe me, it will end. The highs you experience will be followed by deeper and deeper lows. And the journey along that road doesn't end well. But, but the apostle, Paul, he tells us something amazing. It, he says that there's a God in heaven who wants to give you grace and peace. If you'll just be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. If you'll just be in Christ. You'll find it. Grace. And you'll find peace. There's deliverance there. And he says if you remain there, that you're going to be faithful. You can't not be if you remain in Christ. Being in Christ means living under the influence of Christ. Of Christ. I want to live under the influence of Christ. How about you? That's where I want to be. It's under the influence of Christ. I'm wondering today if you want to join me for that. If you could stand up today and say, I'm going to live my life under the influence of Jesus Christ. If that's, if that's your desire today, just stand up. I just want to pray for you this morning. Now let's pray together. Father in heaven, this world has nothing for us. Grief, pain, misery. And yet, Father, you... You offer us a location in Christ where we can get things that, that we can't find anywhere else. Grace that we so desperately need. Peace that this world really knows nothing about. And so, Father, this morning we stand here and it's our desire, Father, to be in Christ. It's our desire, Father, to, to live a life that's pleasing to you. Many of us have tried to do it on our own and have failed miserably. But this morning, Father, we recognize that you're calling us to move. To move from where we are to where your son is. To be in Christ. To be under the influence. That we might begin, Father, to have victory. That we might begin to experience liberty. That we might also, Father, begin to understand something of grace and something of peace. And so we praise you, Father, for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who demonstrated what righteousness looks like. And we pray, Lord, that as we, as we are in Christ, that you would free us from the bonds of sin, that you would empower us, Father, to have victory where we've only ever had failure before, and that you would inspire us then, Father, to invite others to experience grace and peace for themselves. And so, Father, bless your people today. Help us, Lord, to, to continue to walk in your way when we leave this building. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.